Mona Baker, you're Professor of Translation Studies at UMIST, that's the University of Manchester Institute of Technology. You're the author of In Other Words, it's one of the most popular course books on translation. You also edited the Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies. You're the editorial director of uh, St. Jerome Publishing. You set up the journal and you're editor of the journal The Translator. You direct the UMIST Master of Science in Translation Studies. You're perhaps the leading researcher in the application of corpus linguistics to translation. Mona Baker, when do you find time to sleep? <laughs> I suppose I sleep on average about seven hours a day, which is um, all you need in the way of sleep. Um, I probably can explain it in terms of where I am situated at the moment, which is mm -hmm. in Britain, where there's very little social life, unlike Spain. And so you have to do something with your time, and I prefer to use it productively. Um, after seven hours of sleep, you don't really need much more than that, so the rest goes to work. <laughs> So, so we're doing translation studies out of boredom, fundamentally. Absolutely. <laughs> going, going back, looking at that list of activities, if you go back to your first, the major book, uh, in other words, that, that's a teaching book, a pedagogical book. And yet your research now is in descriptive translation studies. Is that a real progression? Have you turned your back on that, that, that pedagogical approach that you first had? No, not at all. I don't see any conflict between the two. I think translation studies descriptive work feeds um, directly into pedagogy, and pedagogy should inform the sort of at least some of the directions of the descriptive work that uh, is being done. I think people sometimes get confused because they assume that um, pedagogy means description, means mm -hmm. that you um, adopt a prescriptive approach, and descriptive means research. It means you don't, you're not concerned with the. Um, how, not, well, not so much with the hows, but with whether something is better or worse, or how to solve a problem and so on. But these are, like a lot of other dichotomies in, in the discipline, they are false dichotomies, and I don't see any conflict between the two. Mm. But what about something like e equivalence, for mm. example? In, in uh, your course book on translation, in, in, in other words, you talk about equivalence quite, quite freely mm. uh, as an ideal to be attained, mm. and would you accept that? Would you reject that now? I think, no, I don't talk about it as an idea to be attained. Um, I think it is in the introduction or the first chapter um, that I say quite explicitly that I adopt the term purely for convenience and that it is a term which is theoretically very suspect. But it's something, it's a term that means something to a lot of practical translators, uh, something they can identify with and I adopt it purely for convenience without having my heart set on it or without believing in it as a concept as such at all. But would you mm -hmm. use that now um, in the work you're doing now? Are you concerned at all with concepts of equivalence? Not at the moment, no. But if I was um, doing something pedagogical again, I may well make use of it. Mm -hmm. But it is not relevant to the kind of work that I'm doing um, at this moment in time because what I'm mostly concerned with at the moment is looking at things like the difference between translated English and original English rather than between translations and source texts. And mm. the concept of equivalence doesn't come into that at all, really. Uh, can you tell us something about your research now? You're using corpus linguistics in this research. Uh, is that an essential step forward in translation studies, do you think? Um, depends on what you mean by essential. Is anything at all mm. essential? Perhaps we <laughs> should explain a bit what we mean by corpus linguistics here. Right. right. Um, what I mean, what, what we mean by corpus linguistics here is um, drawing on um, a, a kind of linguistics that's developed in the last 30 or 40 years or so, where people uh, increasingly use the computer to do the kind of um, very time-consuming analysis that they would have had to do by hand before the advent of computers and this kind of technology. And so they make, uh, make a lot of texts available in machine-readable form, and then they get the computer to sift through a lot of instances of any particular feature that they're interested in and to give them the results without them having to spend days, months, weeks, whatever, uh, doing it by hand. And I think that has um, very interesting applications in, in translation studies. That's, that's what I've been trying to, to develop, to uh, free our time to look more at the motivations for particular types of 
behavior in translation um, by uh, allowing the computer to do the kind of manual analysis that they, we would have had to spend a lot of time doing mm -hmm. with it before we could even start thinking about the whys and wherefores and where next and so on. So, so how have you set this up? You're, you, you're comparing uh, translations into English mm -hmm. with untranslated or non-translational English. How, how, do you, how did you set up this comparison? Um, well, first of all, I, I, I don't just do that. I'm interested in, in the applications of corpus linguistics in a number of different ways, but uh, w what I've done, what the group of humans have done in the last few years is to set up a corpus, a computerized collection of translated English, which is known as um, TEC, Translational English Corpus, and uh, to use that to uh, capture certain features of translated English and then well, you can only, of course, you, you don't know what is distinctive about something unless you compare it with something else. Comparison is inherent in this kind of process. So we look at a, a comp again, computerized collection of original English, which is, in our case, mostly the British National Corpus, to see where original English and translated English differ from each other in terms of uh, for example, testing the claims of theorists like Gideon Turi um, and other theorists who have claimed things like um, the idea that translated text tends to be very conventional, that it lacks creativity, that it shies away from uh, being playful with language and so on. Um, you, you, you take basically, you take the corpus of translated English and you take the corpus of original English and you see whether there is evidence for statements of this type, for example. But, but that's only one part of it. Another part of it is to use the resources like the translated English corpus to see patterns of variation within the corpus without reference to original English. So I've used it, for instance, to look at uh, stylistic variation between two translators, whether uh, to, to start looking at whether translators, e every individual translator has their own individual style um, that can be described in by comparison to another translator, for instance. That's a study that's coming out in, in target soon. Okay. Do you think that kind of, that's, that's descriptive translation studies? I mean, it's one of its purest forms, I suppose. Whatever that is, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that's of real help to translators? I think it can be, yes. Um, assuming that translators um, are inquisitive enough, they must be, because there are people who work with language all the time, people who have to be on top of all kinds of things to perform their job properly. They have to know about um, current affairs, they have to know about historical matters, they have to know about all kinds of things. And therefore, by, n by their very nature, they are curious, inquisitive people. And they must be curious about mm -hmm. what it is they do when they sit down and translate and how that compares to what other people who are involved in the same kind of activity do. Um, and I think, as with any other walk in life, it, knowledge is power and understanding what it is that you do and how you compare with other people puts you in a better position to um, change it if you want to change it or accept it if you want to see how it fits in with other things and why it is the way it is. So ultimately, I think it is useful, apart from anything else, because knowledge is always power. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned uh, the idea that, that, that translations are more conventional than non-translations. And we also have what's called the explicitation hypothesis that yes. says translational language is more explicit than non-translational language. Not sexually explicit, but you should. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are they true? Are those true hypotheses? Have, have you found them to be justified? Um, I've only done um, a small amount of relatively very little really research in this area simply because we don't have uh, a, a sufficiently large resource to make any reliable generalizations at the moment. So, but based on what um, I've done so far, what colleagues of mine have done, the explicitation hypothesis seems to hold to some extent grammatically. So there is evidence, for instance, that translators tend to spell out the optional that in reporting structures it seems far, far more often than original writers in mm. the same domain. The, the, the optional that is when we say the man I saw, the man that I saw. No, or it's when you say um, he said he was coming tomorrow as opposed he said that he was mm -hmm. coming tomorrow. But also there are other similar structures which we intend to look at next, like um, the use of nouns and adjectives. So when you say it's a pity 
he um, he didn't come or it's a pity that he didn't come. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's sad. It was sad that it happened or it was sad it happened. These are all, there's a whole um, um, collection of structures, group of structures that behave in a similar way. We've only tested it for reporting verbs like say and um, tell and claim and suggest and, and hope and wish and so on. And you find a pronounced difference between translations? So far, very pronounced difference, mm-hmm. um, very significant difference. Uh, in terms of uh, conventionality, this, this kind of um, issue really needs a larger focus than we have at the moment. We have about six and a half million words, which is not very much by corpus linguistic terms. We have six and a half million words of translated English. And uh, if you're going to test creativity, productivity, uh, playfulness with language, you need a lot more than that, because you need to see the proportion of one off to repeat it mm-hmm. happens, and, and that requires a lot more data. We haven't mm-hmm. got to it yet. Okay. I'd like to go back now. Okay. Let, let's imagine Mona Baker when she was 25 or so. <laughs> you were born in Cairo. That's right. People think you're English, but <laughs> you are. <laughs> Are you English or Egyptian? Or I'm Egyptian, definitely. Egyptian. <laughs> Arab, yes. Uh, what were you doing when you were 25? Did you think you were going to become a professor at UMIS? Absolutely for not. <laughs> I wasn't yes. thinking of an academic career at all at the time. I was um, probably, I think, 24, 25, I was working as a secretary, as a bilingual secretary, having finished a, a BA in English and Comparative Literature in Egypt. And uh, as part of my work, I always did translation. If you know two languages in a country like Egypt, then whatever you end up doing, people ask you to do translation mm-hmm. as part of the, of the work. So I was doing a lot of translations. I was working as a secretary because it was a well-paid job. It paid a lot more than being a university lecturer, um, mm-hmm. and I needed the money to, to live on. And then I uh, met my husband, who is English, and who was working in Egypt at the time. And we met, we got married, and I think we left the country when I was about 25. Um, you left Egypt then, very early, a long time ago. Yes, um, over, over 20 years ago. Do you still feel Egyptian, or have you become <laughs> English? You have an English passport, a British passport. I have a British uh, passport, but I also have an Egyptian passport, mm-hmm. although it's run out at the moment, <laughs> mm-hmm. so it can be renewed. Um, I feel, uh, I certainly don't feel British in the sense of political loyalty. Uh, I think these things come out very strongly at times of crisis, and when we have crises, as we are having at the moment in the Middle East, I certainly feel Mm. far more Arab than British. Do you think you bring some kind of Arabic perspective into translation studies? Is there anything there that is specific to your particular background? No, I'm not sure that there is anything specific about that, except that when you come from a less Western language, Mm -hmm. uh, you tend to see the cracks in Western theory a little bit uh, uh, more easily because you you don't have the same set of assumptions that uh, being Western and being situated in the English-speaking world tends to cloud, I think, people's vision to some extent. But, but, But nothing in what I do is particularly Arab, I would say, in terms of translation studies. Okay, so let's go back. You're 25 or so, you're, you've left Egypt, you've yes. come to Britain. Mm-hmm. How do you get into translation studies? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had always been translating, and when I first came to, um, went to Britain with my husband, I thought that the only thing I would be able to do really is to just carry on translating. Uh, I did do secretarial work for a while, and I did a lot of translation. And then after a while, I got a little bit... Um, bored with just doing translations and I decided to do a get back to studying at that stage not really thinking of an academic career but just because I wanted to I was inquisitive curious like mm-hmm. most translators and I thought I wanted to know a little bit more about um, about, about, about this whole business of translation something a bit more reliable than sitting in a corner and doing it on my own and not knowing how I relate to other people at all uh, but at the time there was practically nothing in Britain or nothing anywhere near where I was living that I could have studied that would have led me to um, know a bit more about translation. So um, one of the people who's influenced my career um, quite decisively, John Sinclair, um, talked me into doing a degree in linguistics as the nearest thing to studying translation. Um, And I did that and I thought I, I really learned a lot from it, but I felt that nobody had really uh, consistently 
applied these things that they taught me on the course for translation trials, in other words. Th this is John Sinclair, who was working on corpus linguistics. That's right, among other things, time, he's yes. a leading linguist. He's a, a linguist of English, of course. Oh, yeah. That's right, yes. very, very monolingual, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Strictly monolingual. <laughs> what other theorists have influenced you? Are they within translation studies or in linguistics more? Or? I think mostly, um, um, I mean, the, the most influential one has been John Sinclair. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anyone else who's influenced my thinking to and that extent. You would see yourself then as a linguist who works on translations? No, definitely not. No? I see myself as somebody who learned linguistics in order to understand translation. It was a pure coincidence. If, um, if I'd met somebody other than John Sinclair, uh, I could have ended up doing a degree on literary theory, for instance, and applying that to translation, as it happened. I, I ran into John Sinclair, and he talked me into doing linguistics, and I enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's a pure coincidence. So, but I see myself as a translation studies scholar, not as a linguist. And you, you quickly become the center of translation studies in 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 Britain, at least, uh, with the translator, the journal, with Saint Jerome Publishing, which is a specialized publisher in in translation. Is translation studies big enough for you? Do we have to grow <laughs> out of translation studies? Are you happy with this disciplinary location? Uh, well, translation studies is big enough for me in terms of uh, giving me enough to do, certainly. Mm. But I don't think that's where the future ultimately lies. I think translation studies has to open up to um, a, a broader context, uh, largely we call it intercultural communication, cross-cultural communication. But it's got to see itself as part of a, of a larger context, increasingly also because the uh, lines between what is translation and what is other forms that are kind of half translational, half mediation through other languages is becoming uh, fuzzier all the time. So mm -hmm. that um, it makes a lot more sense for translation studies to align itself more closely with the whole area of intercultural communication, cross-cultural communication, call it what you will. Uh, as you missed, you're moving towards uh, uh, another master's in intercultural studies. Indeed, yes. that, that's what you mean by intercultural studies. That's is right. It? Um, any kind of context that involves people bringing a um, very different set of assumptions to the interaction based on, um, on anything like ethnicity, gender, um, age gap, um, um, nationality, mm -hmm. linguistic background, and so on. Right. So what are your projects for the next year or two years or so, <laughs> short-term <laughs> projects? What are, we, what are you involved in now? Um, well, I had started to write a book called The Pragmatics of Cross-Cultural Contact in an attempt to uh, begin to open up um, the dialogue between translation studies and other areas of cross-cultural communication. Uh, but at the same time, we are uh, setting up a totally independent postgraduate center at CUNY Center for um, Translation and Intercultural Studies. And that takes a, a fair bit of administration, so that's taking up a lot of my time, slowing down the work on the book, also slowing down the research on the corpus. But it's very important, so that's one of my major projects for the next year or so, is to set up that uh, center and to start the, the new degree in intercultural communication. So you're an organizer or an administrator for the moment? <laughs> But you, haven't <laughs> but you haven't left writing books or doing, no. doing research as such. I hope not. <laughs> Good. So we can look forward to more books in uh, the near future. Eventually in due course, yeah. <laughs> Fine. Mona Baker, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Yes. We're okay.